Today, I'm going to discuss the attempted hit on Al Diaco at the Kimberly Hotel. I've covered it before a long time ago, but glossed over a lot of the facts. In this video, I'll be adding actual footage of Manhattan and pictures inside the Kimberly Hotel as well. So without further ado, let's go back to 1991. On September 18, 1991, a meeting took place between the Lucchese and Bonanno families. The reason for the meeting was a sit-down in regard to a Lucchese member, Frank Legano, beating the Bonannos out of money. Legano himself would be killed years later in 2007. Nonetheless, back then, Legano had an associate who lost 400000 gambling with the Bonanno bookmakers and beat them out of the money. As a result, the Bonannos were holding Legano responsible for the money. As a member of Cosa Nostra, you're not only responsible for your own actions, but for the actions of your associates as well. The initial meeting location was at a restaurant called Chin Chin that used to be on 216 East 49th Street. Presently, that location is vacant. Al Diaco, who months early was the Lucchese acting boss, but at this time, a member of the ruling panel, showed up at Chin Chin for the meeting. When he arrived, Anthony Boaparata, a Lucchese captain and panel member, was standing outside with Frankie Pearl Federico, another member of the family. A short while later, the acting Bonanno boss, Anthony Spiro, his underboss, Sal Vitale, and Captain Johnny Green Ferracci all showed up at the restaurant. I want to explain how this became a high-level sit-down. Sometimes sit-downs can start out with two members, as in this case, Legano and a Bonanno member. If they can't come to a mutual agreement, it gets kicked up to their captains. If the captain still can't resolve the issue, it goes to the administration of both families. Although they met at Chin Chin, the actual place for the sit-down will be at the Kimberly Hotel, which is on East 50th Street, a block away from the restaurant. Frankie Pearl escorted the Banana Group over to the hotel. The Arco stayed behind with Boat, who, according to him, seemed edgy and kept checking the time on his watch. Frankie Pearl returned to Chin Chin, and this time he'd be escorting Diaco to the hotel. But Watt explained that he was going to stay behind and wait for Frankie Lasterino, another member of the panel. Diaco walked down 3rd Avenue with Frankie Pearl, who he knew from prison and felt was unusually quiet and was acting out of character. They walked a short distance, and when they reached East 50th Street, Frankie Pearl handed Diaco a piece of paper with the room number 29B written on it. Once inside the hotel, Diaco took the elevator up to the 29th floor and was greeted at 29B by Sal Avellino, who was also a member of the panel. Inside the room with the Bananos was Legano and fellow Lucchese member Anthony Curley Russo. Both Legano and Russo were members of the Arcos crew. At some point, Boat Frankie Lasterino showed up. The sit-down was finalized with the Lucchese's losing the decision by default, and Legano was held responsible to pay the Bananos. When the Bonanno members left, the Lucchese panel dealt with family business. A panel is usually put in place for them to make group decisions. Diaco, in his own words, explained the negative vibe he was feeling. Conversely, in Gaspipe's book, Confessions of a Mafia Boss, the Kimberly Hotel incident is described as Diaco's paranoia and uncontrollable fear. I would agree, had there not been other telltale signs leading up to it. In that life, a very monotonous one, when people and things are off, something is up. Remember, when there's bad intentions with a guy, not everyone knows how to play it cool. Someone or more than one person will always tip their hand. The first sign that something was wrong for Diaco was six months after he'd been placed in the acting boss position, he was taken down, which means he was pulled from that position. And this took place during a secret meeting with the fugitive Lucchese bosses, Vicar Musso and Gaspipe Castle. At that meeting, Vic wouldn't even look the Arco in the face and gave him the cold shoulder. He then announced that he was dissolving all acting positions in the family and creating a panel. At that same meeting, they also took away control of the family's airport rackets from the Arco. And about a week after the meeting, they transferred Patty De La Rosso out of his crew. At the time, Patty was one of the guys watching over the Lucchese's interest at the airport. The Arco would also lose three more members of his crew, including Legano and Russo. Another sign happened with Dom Trisulo, a captain in the family, who Diaco was good friends with, began giving him the cold shoulder as well. And when Diaco ran into the consigliere for the Genovese family, Jimmy Ida, he treated him the same. When they label a person in that life as bad or no good, word spreads quickly. You could be innocent, but you're guilty as soon as the first person spreads the rumor. Back inside the hotel room, Diaco overheard a comment by Frankie Lastarino to Boat that maybe things will be better soon. 
possibly an innocuous comment, but combined with everything else, definitely a comment to question. The Arco, who is naturally now on alert, clocked Frankie Lasterino's trips to the bathroom. He made five of them. So either he had a bladder problem or he liked bathrooms. When Boat announced that he had to leave for another appointment, the Arco attempted to leave as well. But Frankie Lasterino told him to wait, that Mikey DeSantis would be coming up to discuss something with them. Unbeknown to Diaco, Mikey was lingering around somewhere downstairs. When Mikey entered the room, Diaco noticed that he was wearing a bulletproof vest underneath his sweatshirt, and at one point when he leaned over, he seen he had a pistol tucked in the back of his pants. I want to explain the significance of that. You're not supposed to bring a pistol to a sit-down or a meeting. It's actually a rule. In fact, in my very last Lucchese meeting, I had to meet with Joe Cafe de Santa, a captain in our family. Prior to that meeting, there were certain members in our family who broke numerous rules, and some events involving myself took place. So when I went to meet Joe Cafe, I had a pistol with me, and he knew I had one. And had anything taken place that day that I felt was a threat to my safety, I absolutely would have used it, and Cafe knew that as well. Anyway, as for Diaco, spotting that pistol was a very bad sign, because there was no reason for Mikey to have it on him. And making matters worse, at one point, Mikey got up to use the bathroom, and he was in there for a while. When he finally did come out, Diaco noticed that he no longer had the pistol on him, so obviously he left it somewhere in the bathroom. One of the things Diaco could have did was excuse himself, go in the bathroom, and look for the pistol, but he never did that. With everything that was going on, being in that hotel room for Diaco was like a bad nightmare. Let's not forget, he witnessed the Lucchese family falsely labeling other guys in the past. Picciotto, who they tried to hit, and luckily he survived it. But guys like Mike Salerno, Bruno Fasciola, and Michael Papadillo were not as fortunate. They were not only falsely accused, but they lost their lives for it as well. The Lucchese's way of doing business within the family is not unknown to other families. I've personally been warned by some people in a serious way, and others did it jokingly. Had Al Diaco not made a quick exit out of that hotel room back in 1991, he most definitely would have been killed. And he knew it. When he did make it out with his life, his first thoughts were to fight back. He had a son, Joseph, in the life who suggested that they find out where gas pipe was hiding and go and take him out. At the end of the day, even if they managed to accomplish that, it wouldn't have helped matters. In fact, it would have only made things worse for the Diacos. In Al Diaco's own words, they mocked me a rat, and I wasn't a rat, and that's an even worse thing to do. Sometimes you don't see the handwriting on the wall until it's your name that's written on the wall. Al Diaco eventually called a lawyer who made contact with the FBI for him. And as most people know, he began cooperating. When people hear things like this taking place, it's easy for them to pass judgment. After all, they do so from the sidelines. Not only are they not playing the game, they never wore a uniform nor will they ever. Naturally, if you hear them tell it, if put in that same position, they would have never done what the Arco did. Of course not. They would have went to war, right? These are the same people, the ones who throw the word rat around on a daily basis, a word, by the way, that shadows their own inferiorities. But the intelligent people know exactly what these people would do. But the finger point is always convinced themselves to believe their own bullshit. <laughs> 